Welcome everyone. I'm Rick Benson, you are, and this is the In the Know Trader podcast on StockCharts.com. This week, we have a special guest with us. He'll be joining us shortly. His name is Jeffrey Hirsch, and he's from the Stock Traders Almanac. But before we get to Jeff, we'll go over a few charts like we usually do. And I'm going to want to spend some extra time on one in particular uh, as it relates to the many chartists on the street who say that we're in the midst of a bear market. So here's my thoughts on that. We didn't have, nor are we in the midst of a bear market. I think from one day that the S&P touched almost 20% from its peak to trough, that's it. It then significantly rallied and hasn't even had a hint of bearishness since. Maybe today, in fact, is the first day uh, we're seeing some bearishness. It's uh, S&P is down about 20 points as, as we uh, start this podcast early in the day. Secondly, um, who said 20% is a bear market and what makes them correct? Uh, to my knowledge, that's a term that uh, came about probably about the last 30 years or so. Uh, Pre-1980, bear markets were not defined by some specific percentage move as they seemingly have become these days at 20% and corrections at 10%. Those are arbitrary numbers that um, I think people have picked up on, but they picked up on them because like so many other things in the marketplace, they're looking for a holy grail. They're looking for specific rules to... Uh, help define what a market is. And I will tell you from someone like myself who's doing this over 35 years, um, I simply can't define a bull or a bear market because of some percentage move uh, that a, a market has made. Um, thirdly, a two-month overall decline in a 10-year bull market does not constitute a bear market. It needs much more time and far more failed rallies than this one's had to even begin to call it a bear market. And probably most importantly, it needs to crater investors' perception that equities will have any meaningful future value. Uh, I'm sorry, future value. And that certainly has not occurred uh, in the December decline. People certainly started losing money. There was some panic selling. Um, but in the bigger picture, when you talk to, as I do, institutional clientele and some retail clients too, um, which is, of course, the in the no trader side of what I do in my consulting business, um, you really didn't get the sense at all that investors had simply given up on the market having future value. Um, and therefore, when I put these ingredients together, it becomes much more difficult for me to come to any conclusion that the decline we saw um, is and was a bear market. And of course, I've read about and know, having done this for decades, that V-shaped bottoms are often the first move. Um, there'll be a correction back downward. And sure, that's still part of this. Uh, but I think the bigger question is, and here uh, we're looking at a chart of the Dow, but again, I typically think in S&P terms, but nonetheless, the Dow got down to uh, 21,750. The S&P got down to 2,347. Um, I believe that those lows we saw in December or the lows of this move, and that any type move down from now uh, will be corrective in nature from this V bottom we had, uh, but will not likely take out the lows we saw in late December, right around Christmas time. Um, and and there's there's another component here, which are as far as I'm concerned. Odds are far more in favor that the December low is the bottom, uh, not just to the U.S. market, but to global markets. 
And I want to show you why I think so and why I've kind of stuck my neck out to clients and made that call. Um, here we're looking at the ETF that tracks the MSCI uh, All World Country Index exclusive of U.S. markets, right? So these are all the major global markets, not including the S&P uh, in its calculation. And we can see that from the 2009 low, uh, the, the recent decline into late fall last year still held above that trend line. Um, and just as, if not more importantly, uh, for those of you who tuned in last week when we first started talking about some of the models I use that were developed by Tom DeMarc, uh, you can see the bottom in early 2016 is on what was called a setup downward nine count. That's nine consecutive price bars. In this case, we're looking at a monthly chart. So that's nine consecutive months that the closing price on the last day of the month was less than the closing price from four months earlier. And often when you do a nine count like this, especially a downward nine count in what is an ongoing bull market, you often have the exhaustion point to the trend. We did that again. Uh, you can see this month of January actually represents the ninth consecutive month, uh, assuming that in the next uh, seven or eight trading days, whatever days we have left to the month of January, we don't have an absolutely massive rally. Uh, then this will also be the ninth month in a row that the close will be less than the close from four months earlier. In my belief that this signifies the bottom to the European and Asian market decline that had been going on all of 2018, whereas the S&P had held in or at least held its own until uh, the very end of the year the Asian and European markets were declining basically from January 1st of 2018, and that's why the S&P had continued to outperform. Uh, looking at this chart gives me significant reason to believe that there's a high likelihood that the lows we saw in December stay the lows of the move, and that this was just a pullback in an ongoing bull market. Now again, this is a monthly chart. Switch this to a weekly chart, and you can see, for those of you who know the sequential model, also developed by Tom DeMar, that when we switch to a weekly time frame, we also have uh, a trend exhaustion signal that's much more significant, which was a weekly 13 count. Um, in future weeks, we'll go over how this model comes up with its counting mechanism, and, and we'll show you other samples of how well this model can help define exhaustion points to trends. But when I combine the monthly setup nine count with the weekly sequential countdown that went to a 13, which is the terminal count to this model, it gives me all the reason I think I need to have to say that the lows we saw will stay the lows we saw. Um, now, let's put this in terms of the S&P. The S&P declined from 2940 last year to 2347 in December, virtually a 600 point move. It's my belief that the lows at 2347 will stay the low. It's also my belief that uh, certainly for the first half of the year and likely for the bulk of 2019, there is no reason to believe that the all-time highs in the S&Ps will be taken out either. After all, we had a 600-point move last year. We certainly can stay within the high and low of last year uh, throughout 2019. So I am generally looking to buy pullbacks in this market. At this point, the worst-case scenario I could see in the S&P is a move down to 25.25. It's still almost 200 points above the December low. And at that point, um, we would be significantly adding long exposure, looking for at some point this year, likely taking out the downtrend line, both in the Acqui index, but also in the S&P. Doesn't mean that turns us into a hugely bull market. It just means in, in the way we look at things, 
that things are likely done on the downside. So that's my call. There is no, there was no bear market. And this was a significant pullback within a 10 year bull trend, but one that saw its bottom in December. Let's take a look at a couple other charts that are important now too. Uh, here's the dollar index just to get some perspective. We showed you this one last week. We'll start here with the red rectangles, a very clear five wave move down from the January 17 high into the uh, January or February 2018 low. It had rallied since. A full two months ago, we had clients uh, get out of their long trade uh, in this kind of yellow boxed area that included both a weekly uh, aggressive sequential 13 count along with a setup count. We've pulled back to the 200 week moving average. We're kind of stuck in here. We've gone neutral the dollar and we were formally neutral the dollar as of right now. The other chart I want to show you before we get to our very special guest is, let's take a look at uh, the 10 year chart. So this is 10 year US yields. Uh, just quickly looking at this chart too, look at how many times weekly nine counts uh, help call turns. Here's a turn here. Here's close to the top here. This one did not work. This called the bottom. This called the high for a few months. Uh, this called the high for a month. This called the high for two years, etc. Uh, nine counts are often good intermediate turning points. And the important thing here is that uh, the first week of 2019 was a nine down again. That's nine consecutive Fridays that the close was less than the close from four Fridays prior. We've seen a turn since. Uh, as I mentioned last week, I expect the range in 10 year this year to be between uh, roughly 3% and 2.4% for the bulk of the year. So I'd love to see one more move underneath uh, the 2.55% lows that we saw early in January or late December uh, to get a chance to get anything close to 2.4%. Uh, in yield terms to ultimately be a seller of bonds. So that's the, um, that's the quick take here on charts. What I wanna do now is flip to um, our very special guest and tell you a little bit about him and also let him certainly expand upon that. So Jeff Hirsch is the CEO of Stock Traders Almanac. Uh, this was a, uh, company started by his dad, Yale Hirsch, back in the 1960s. Very well-known gentleman on Wall Street who, by 1968, started uh, public, uh, I'm sorry, publishing a, an annual almanac that became a very key reference point for lots of different patterns that had shown up in the markets over time, often related to the different months of uh, the year, which months, um, perform best, which ones performed worse. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the whole idea of sell in May and go away uh, essentially started from Yale Hirsch, uh, having observed and essentially done back testing. Uh, and we're talking 50 years ago. So this is before computers were around. So I uh, got to give credit to somebody who did a tremendous amount of work by hand. Um, and, and thoroughly studied markets for particular seasonal patterns, uh, the January effect and so on, are all credited uh, to the Stock Traders Almanac. So first off, let me introduce Jeff. Jeff is someone I've known for several years and welcome him to our show. Jeff, so thanks so much for coming on with us today. Hey, my pleasure, Rick. Can you hear me okay? I hear you fine. I hear you fine. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Well, it's it's truly a pleasure, Jeff. Uh, and in fact, roles and are reversed. Thanks for the because, introduction. Yeah, there are times that uh, you and I have been at conferences, and you've actually interviewed me. So I, I remember last in uh, Las Vegas last year at the Money mm -hmm. Show, uh, you had interviewed me for several minutes. And um, as I like to bring guests on on my podcast too, I thought that you would be uh, a very good choice to have, given your personal history in this company, if I'm not mistaken, um, you're kind of just around the age of when this very first Almanac came out. So yeah. 
It's been a part of your entire life. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, I was born and raised uh, into the business. Um, worked my way up from the mailroom originally. I used to do some of those calculations by hand with my father um, back when I was in high school and college and working for him uh, part time. Um, most memorably is the uh, probability calendars and charts in the back of the almanac and the half hourly trading patterns where we would take out the Barron's lab pages and underline either up days or up half hour ticks with a red pen and a short little ruler and then work it on the adding machine, you know, um, with another uh, coworker and plot it all on a graph paper and create those charts. Um, and as you, you know, you mentioned the, the sell man go away, that's an old British saw, but what Yale did was um, create and discover the best and worst six month switching strategy, which was first published in the uh, 1987 Stock Traders Almanac, which came out in 1986. So that wasn't done in the original one, but it was definitely something that was done by hand and a lot of research. Um, so yeah, basically I've been born, bred, weaned, raised uh, on market seasonalities, pattern cycles, uh, election cycles, daily cycles, intraday cycles, monthly cycles, patterns, all that stuff. So, and here we are in January, where um, one of Yale's most famous uh, discoveries, inventions, the January barometer, um, as well as the Santa Claus rally in the first five days um, exists. So, uh, so far, so good. We're two out of two for the January indicator trifecta. So based upon how January has started and kind of the rip we've had to the upside, uh, historically, this sets out 2019 as a, a net up year by the end of the year? Uh, yes, it does. And in addition, it's a pre-election year, which is the best year of the four-year cycle. Um, and I had written back in the 2019, when I wrote the 2019 Almanac back in uh, you know, May, June, when we put it to bed, sent it to the press, um, that you know the likelihood of a of a banner 2019 would be improved um, with a, a some sort of you know very typical midterm correction and pullback, which came a little bit later than normal, but uh, we did get a very typical midterm correction, and um, I think that set up the the, the four year cycle for for a positive year. You were mentioning about the bear markets in your uh, opening remarks there, and I, I do agree with you. Um, there is a, uh, a bear market metric that we've been using, and I think it might, uh, you know, help your listeners. I'm sure some people have heard of it. Maybe you have. There's the Ned Davis research rules. You're familiar with that, Rick? I know Ned, but tell tell me what this rule is and tell well, our listeners. It's it's actually something we've been do, using in the Almanac for years. Something that Yale um, uh, signed on to, or at least became a proponent of. And it's it's a little bit more nuanced than just 10 percent or 20 percent. And what it calls uh, for is a 13% um, decline over 145 calendar days peak to trough in the Dow Jones Industrial. So the correction we had was, uh, it wasn't quite 13%, it was 12 something of memory service on the Dow, close to close, not intraday, which you know everyone likes to manipulate it. Um, so, but the, the timing wasn't long enough. So you have to have a combination of decline and time, which I think is, you know, a sensible, a sound um, rationalization or a, a sound reason behind that. And then there's also 30% reversals in the value line um, uh, index is, is the way the definition. And on the flip side, for a bull market, it's a, a move of the, of the same magnitude of 13% of the Dow over 155 calendar days. So you're looking about, you know, the six month area a you know, five, six month area for any type of move like that, um, it, you know, to be a bear or bull market, unless it's of greater magnitude, like 30%. So, well, so that, that's interesting because that's kind of what my perspective is having been in the markets for uh, several decades that, um, you know, we, we peaked in October and bottom essentially Christmas time. Uh, probably exactly. in the neighborhoods of 10 weeks or so, give or take. I just, I, my 38 years of experience tells me that's just not enough time to define exactly. the bear market. And, and if, you, if you look in the back of the almanac on pages 131 and 132, we have all the bull and bear markets since 1900. And you can see that the 
2000, October 3rd, 2011, and the um, February 11, 2016 dates, we have as fair market lows as determined by the Ned Davis research rules. And I've gone back and forth with, with Ned and, and the firm, and we've done some posts, and, and we actually helped them clarify the language uh, for it to be peak to trough um, back in 2016 when we put up a post on our blog, you know, declaring the, the fair market um, uh, parameters had been reached, uh, Ned Davis parameters had been reached, and they called us up and said, well, PSA doesn't say peak to trough. I said, well, you're right. We've been using peak to trough, and they went ahead and, um, you know, updated the language to be, to be clearer. Well, so that, that brings me to a question, Jeff, because you've been around for quite some time, too. How mm -hmm. much sense does it make for the investing public, whether professionals or individual investors, to almost search for this holy grail of defining market moves, you know, in exact percents? Imagine, so if, if this rule was 13% close to close over 145 calendar days, you know, if it was 143 calendar days, would you go, ah, well, it's not a bear market according to this. Uh, or if it was only 11.5% instead of 13%. There's this drive for people to label things. And, and I think the labeling is probably the worst thing that happens because you then set in their mind this definition. And think of this too in terms of, uh, the individual investor who is watching CNBC or Bloomberg or Fox and, mm -hmm. and hear, hear somebody say, uh, we're in a bear market. We have now made a bear market. It, it's, Even more so. It, it has to color. Like they say Apple's in a bear market. You know, tech's in a bear market. Oil's in a bear market. The Russell's in a bear market. I mean, a bear market's all market. You know, it's not just one individual stock or one sector. Um, you know, I mean, you could, I, I'll, I'll allow country by country, you know, or region by region, you know, you're going to have the U.S. is in a bear market, you know, the European Union's not, you know, China's in a bear market, you know, Japan's not, you know, that, that kind of thing I, I'm okay with. But, you know, outside of a country or um, a, uh, a union like, like um, Europe, uh, I think labeling like that is, is um, counterproductive. But I it's agree. part of human nature. I mean, we, we uh, became who we are by labeling things as groups. So we knew what was what. We knew what was safe to eat and what was safe to, what was easy to kill and, you know, what was, you know, a good place to, to you know, set up camp. You know, it, it goes way back to prehistoric um, human evolution of uh, needing to label stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. But I, it, I, I agree it's counterproductive because it does sway people's psychology when they hear supposed yeah. experts um, define and label things. It's just, it's, but, you know, it, it's, okay, it's okay if somebody says, hey, I think we're, in a, we're going to be or we'll, we'll, we are in a bear market that's going lower, then you make adjustments to your portfolio or investments accordingly. But to claim, you know, it's a bear market already without hitting those levels is, is difficult. I mean, we have some stuff. Uh, that have, that's been in the back of the Almanac since uh, for, forever from Gerald Loeb, who was one of the, the great analysts. And it was his battle plan, you know, for investment survival and his investment survival checklist, you know, about um, if I should buy or sell a stock. And, you know, the, one of the things like, um, you know, if you think it's a bull market, or at least a market where some stocks live and some stocks, stocks stay mark time and only a few declines do not sell unless you see a bear market ahead you see trouble for a particular company in which you own shares and, um, you know, or you found a, a better position that you want to be in or your shares stop going up. So, you know, it's not horrible to say I'm in a bear. I mean, I've called bear markets a little bit earlier back in 08. You know, we felt we were entering a bear market. I don't feel like we're in, you know, the beginning of 08 type of a situation. It doesn't mean we can't, you know, retest those lows. And I think the one thing that, you know, I was looking at your charts over there, I, I jumped away for a second, but the, the low that you, you had there on the, on the Dow, if you want to maybe pull that chart back up, if you can, while I'm talking, um, there's a, a support line back in uh, August of, of, of 87, of, not 87, of 2017, excuse me, <laughs> um, 
Freudian slip there, I guess. Uh, you can um, you can see back over here. Yeah, you, you just had it there. Go back to the same the same view you had. Yeah. You see back in, in in seventeen, that's one of the lows that I think we found some solid support at, and that was something we were looking at back in you know mid December as the, the climb was gathering momentum. Yeah. Um, that we were looking for a little bit lower, and that was the next level of support, and that's kind of where we we have found some. Uh, it may need to retest it. Uh, it doesn't have to retest it all the way. Um, if it did and came back up again, you'd be looking at something that we like we like to uh, find at W123 swing bottom. Um, the last one, as you can see, in October, uh, November fail, we broke through that. Another, since you're, you're kind of a technical um, show here, if you maybe zoom in a little bit to, to last um, fall, the last quarter, which was supposed to be one of the best quarters of the four-year cycle and wasn't, and that's sort of a negative indication. You can see the W bottom um, that failed uh, exactly right there. Once you break through that, yep. pretty good signal to get the to get out of the way a bit. Um, and on the reverse of that, this is also becomes a, a an M one two three top, and we broke through the middle part there. Uh, you know the, the um, yep. Same thing. Yeah, and this was uh, yeah, the November. This, 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 this was like twenty six thirty five. It's a little north of. Uh, this looks so like there, a, there a was some technical port. indications yeah. there, and um, we've got to break a few that trend line. We're, we're, we've also got a couple of moving averages that everybody watches the two hundred days and fifty days that are going to have to be cleared. And uh, is that your battery life or is that mine that you're popping up there? Uh, should be yours. I don't think. I don't think I it's hope, mine. I hope not. <laughs> I just saw a warning. Well, let me ask yeah. you this, Jeff. One more question. We've got a little over a minute to go. Um, sure. Tell me, what are you guys doing? Does, does Stock Traders Almanac do anything in the commodity space? We do. We did a book called The Commodity Traders Almanac with John Person uh, for a number of years. We're going to re resurrect that. And I learned a lot from John. The W123 swing stuff was what we picked up from John, um, amongst other technical uh, knowledge. But uh, oil is and copper are two things that are in play right now. We do well with trading copper using highly correlated stocks, which makes a December low. Um, and the oil stocks also make a December, um, you know, general you know, low in December. And, of course, natural gas. So there's a couple of trades there that we put out to our newsletter subscribers. And there's one other seasonal trade that we do that's not commodities, but it's uh, buying the new lows on triple witching uh, Friday in December, we call it the only free lunch on Wall Street, and it was a banner uh, a basket this year, up about 25 and a half percent on average since um, the 24th. When we, of course, we had a nice correction that we jumped on. Uh, that, that strategy works very well after a big pullback. So yeah, well, we we, we um, certainly had a great pullback, and and that timing mechanism worked perfectly into the Christmas low. Jeff, I want to thank you. Like 1500. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, nope. Rick. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for uh, having been our guest today. Here you can see, in order to contact me, I'm Rick at InnoTrader.com for questions. We thank Jeffrey Hirsch of the Stock Traders Almanac, and we'll be back again next week. Bye-bye.